No to mamy ustalone. Mhm. Okej. Okay. Oh. You're... That's too audible, I think. Sorry about that. Um, moving right along. Now we have three panelists. All of them come from 80 games. Um, let me shortly announce them. Mr. Jan Laskowski is a self-proclaimed colorblind programmer, which is quite curious, isn't it? Working in mobile games industry, his latest titles are Another Case Solved and Puzzle, uh, Puzzle Craft 2. Welcome to the stage, Jan Laskowski. Well done. Uh, Mr. Michał Ociepa is a director at 80 Games Technical Department as a lead programmer and is responsible for all technical aspects. <laughs> Welcome. And Mr. Olger Rutkowski. <laughs> Big applause. Uh, he works also at 80 Games and he's been working for the Good Game Studio also. So, guys, bring it on. Okay, where's the mic? Hi. Uh, we're 80 games, as it was said. Uh, I'm Olo, Michael, and John. So, first of all, we want to show you a little disclaimer. This presentation won't be a programming tutorial. Uh, this presentation will not be a game design lecture. And hopefully, it won't be a contest of bad puns. And what we want to present you is how we do our games. Uh, you may know us as uh, the creators of Puzzlecraft and Another Case Solved. And this lecture is mostly based on our latest game, Puzzlecraft 2. So, let's begin. Um, so, this is a screenshot of uh, our game, The Village. This is the most common uh, view of our game. And what I'd like to tell you about is how we make GUI at this time. So, first of all, whole GUI in our game is made from scratch and the text. So it's made by programmers. Uh, we don't have any tools. We never had any tools for it. Uh, there was no need. So what we get from designers, the graphic designers, is some kind of mock-up with everything pointed out where it should be. And uh, yeah. This is a very tedious process because most of our UI animations also come from code and they have to be done by programmers who have no point, have no idea how to make graphics and the animation. And there is no real way to automate the process, which is, uh, which is a problem because you cannot just make 30 pop-ups uh, uh, do automatically. You have to make each one of them separately. This, of course, is a cost for a lot of spaghetti code. You get a lot of logic in your views, and even simple views as this one, which displays just text, is lots of code, which is barely visible, I see now. Uh, and it's just not nice. You shouldn't have this, and you shouldn't be doing this uh, uh, like that. Next on, we also, the process is also very, um, we have to iterate a lot with our graphic designers. We start off with one view, we implement it, we design it in code, and then it changes. So we have to again iterate it and, and write again, and so on and so on, until the graphic designers are happy with it. Um, also, nev you never know how the design will approach GUI. This is very weird for me to say, maybe, but if you ever plan to have some kind of almanac in your game, which combines all the data in game, you have to prepare to have all the atlas, texture atlases loaded at, the, at any time in your game. Because, for example, here, we are on a puzzle view, and we have all the puzzles loaded, but also we have to load all the village textures and all the, all the, everything loaded at the same time. It, it, it's not a nice thing. So you have to prepare for that if you want to have some kind of almanac in the game. Next on. Oh, I'm talking too fast, sorry. At some point in our game, we came up to the process of creating tutorial. Um, tutorial is also a very hard thing, as you know, because you make the game and then you have to disembowel it to create tutorial, to separate all the mechanics into different ones to show the user how it works. We wanted to create the tutorial as, 
as easy as it could be and it should be showing only when you encounter some mechanic that needs explaining. We came up with a dialogue system which is a very simple thing. It's a pop-up, it's a nine scale node with some text, some graphic and a worker which tells you what you should do or tells you what you, you, sh you, sh have, you have done. And it's very nice because this is how the dialogues look in our config file and designers can hook up an action which displays a dialogue to any entity on their game. For example, when you're unlocking a puzzle, uh, there is an action which tells us, yeah, you, you have to show this dialogue which explains what this puzzle does. Or for example, when you're building a building, it tells you what the building does and what you should then do next. Next on, also because of the uh, way system, the dialogue system is done and that workers address you as a queen or king, we needed some simple uh, localization system with genders. So when a game is uh, firstly played, you have to choose whether you want to be addressed as a king or as a queen and then uh, we have two columns in our config file for one for male and one for female and there is, there is no female string and the player is a female, it grabs a male string as a default. And of course the whole file is parsed from Excel file like most of our configs and it looks like that. You can see the column on the left is a male column and the column on the right is a male column, female column, sorry. And I'll give the mic back to John who will talk about multiplayer in our game. Hello everyone. Uh, okay, so this is my part. Uh, Royal Quests. Yes, the proud multiplayer feature of our game. Um, before I delve into the technicals, let me tell you about uh, what are the real, uh, the, what are Royal Quests in our game. Uh, there are basically hard challenges that can be completed with a group of friends. Uh, one person starts a uh, a challenge, for example, collect 125 stones, uh, does their best, and the others uh, can join and uh, do some help. If the challenge is completed, they, uh, everyone gets a, the same reward, and if it fails, everyone gets a reward, but a small one. Uh, but uh, what I want to tell you is that the main reason uh, uh, Yes, uh, we, uh, our, we wanted to focus on a feature that players do not have to stay all the time online. It's very important for us because it's a mobile game, so you don't always have to have the connection to the internet if you are driving to subway or something. Um, for this reason, uh, we cache uh, all the data that is produced for the user. We also uh, store in a queue all the requests uh, sent to the server. And the player uh, works on a conjunction of the, those data, uh, of these data and the data downloaded directly from the server. And uh, it works in a way that once we start or join a quest, the user can simply turn off the internet in their device and they can proceed without any breaks. Uh, they can finish the quest, collect the reward, everything offline. Uh, but for this to work, we had to set up so-called hard points of synchronization because at some point we have to make sure that all the changes played made are somehow reflected on the server side. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that is why when we start to join, uh, when we try to start to join a quest, we have to make sure that all the requests that were initially stored in a queue are properly handled by a server. If any of them fails, that means that the uh, player has some kind of connection problems and we present this uh, nice uh, warning pop-up then. Uh, that's uh, all for uh, Royal Quest, but let's talk about class platform multiplayer. Because we want to play with friends, where can we find them? Um, we support three different uh, operating systems, Android, iOS and Windows, this is kind of obvious. Uh, so for, uh, uh, from the objective to create players friends list, we use three fram frameworks. Uh, that is Facebook, Game Center, and Google Play Games. Okay, that sounds great. We collect uh, all the data from those frameworks. 
but uh, what in a situation what should we do in a situation when one person appears in all of these frameworks under different data Jan, Johnny, Zenex, Zezula appear in all of those uh, so we have one person in three frameworks what should we do uh, well we came up with something called user ID and uh, it was in a way that once we Log, log in for the first time in our game to any of these frameworks, for example, Game Center. Uh, we create a new, unique ID for this player, which stores this ID and framework ID and some player's uh, uh, profile related data. And then, if we. Oh my God, am I shouting? No. Uh, then, if we. Whoops. The, sorry. Technical problems. Yes. And then if we connect to a different framework, we already know the user ID, so we simply plug in all those data back to uh, this ID. And in the end, we, in our database, under this user ID, we have a whole profile for a single person. Uh, it works pretty well, uh, but there are some problems, mm, especially when people share their devices. For example, if I play on my phone, uh, using Game Center, and for example, Olo takes my phone and logs into Facebook, he will immediately, um, I want to use the word steal, but it's not uh, actually it's, uh, theft, um, uh, he will appear, uh, in, uh, his friends will see his profile with my data. So it's kind of unfair, but uh, our solution for this is that we simply don't care because everything will sort out when we log to our own devices, which is pretty nice, I think. Mm, okay, th I think that's all for uh, this part. Uh, I pass the microphone to Michal. Here you are. Hello, everybody. Uh, okay, so let's go to the buildings which are placed on the village. Uh, they, uh, in their simplest form, are just bitmaps, uh, but uh, when but in most cases, uh, they consist of multiple layers of graphics which uh, are assembled together uh, using Adobe's Flash uh, and exported using custom JSFL script, which is basically JavaScript with access to Flash API. And uh, the Flash and JSFL combo is a great thing and you should really check it out if you want to make some custom tool for, for lever or content creation. Uh, Notice these two colored uh, elements. Uh, they slide away from the building. Uh, these are originally white graphics that are tinted by the artist in Flash to a specific color. Uh, export script uh, uses the specific tint values to recognize and mark them as being either uh, colorable roof when it's green or colorable walls when it's blue. So, but the artists don't always have clear understanding what is what. Uh, Okay, so billings can also cons be composed out of an, uh, uh, animations. Uh, and when artists want to use an animation as building part, he places placeholder graphic with matching size uh, to that of animation he replaces to position it inside uh, our, level edit uh, our buildings editor. And uh, for every animation we use uh, inside PuzzleGraph 2, we use little tool slash library called SuperAnim. Uh, this tool allows us for animations uh, to be created inside Flash and exported with uh, SuperAnim's uh, custom exporter for later usage inside the game. Uh, and we approach coloring animation parts in the buildings a uh, similar way we do that of uh, graphics. Uh, animation creator tints them inside uh, Flash, uh, but uh, the coloring uh, on the uh, game side is done a little bit differently. Uh, we use a dirty little hack. We're capturing, uh, we're capturing uh, every animation's draw call, uh, and before uh, these color uh, values would be passed to vertex shader uh, as color attribute, then we replace it with our own, own color or player's color. Uh, yes, it's dirty, uh, it's slow, but it gets the jobs done, and we still have 60 FPS. Uh, also, when building is placed on a village scene, uh, it needs to properly overlap with uh, other village elements. By default, every building uh, uses uh, its z-order anchor. Uh, it's placed on the bottom of the rectangle containing the building. But artists can modify this value by moving uh, z onto gizmo, which in our case is any object in flash layer, uh, which is properly named. Uh, and here you can see as this red line. Uh, 
also the buildings in Puzzlecraft 2 were designed to reflect uh, some other choices than colors made by player. Uh, player often changes which puzzles he uses in his uh, farm mini game. Uh, and some buildings uh, are designed to uh, reflect those changes, to those choices. Uh, and you can see here the building uh, is housing sheep or sheep, uh, sheep or pigs. Uh, and uh, to do this, uh, uh, player uh, artist setups uh, these slots as, uh, with placeholder graphics and uh, names the layer using specified uh, puzzle type ID number, so we could recognize it later when we put it in the game. Uh, okay, now let's talk about walkers, uh, which are walking around the village. There is always about 20 or more walkers, uh, wo wo workers walking around the village. Uh, and worker, is, worker movement is uh, solved by interpolating curve. Uh, this is quadratic Bezier curve. Uh, this curve are drawn inside village level editor, but uh, I will talk about it later. Uh, when we made first uh, movement interpolation, it turned out that our curve interpolation algorithm was nonlinear and uh, the curve length approximation was really inaccurate, but uh, it made everything look a little bit natural, natural, so we left it like that. So the workers move uh, a little bit more natural. Okay. <laughs> uh, assemble. Uh, workers are assembled uh, with, uh, every worker has a universal moving hand, uh, changeable upper body outfit and uh, legs or skirt. Uh, okay, and this is a funny part. Every worker has separate sex and gender values inside our config file. Uh, gender one being used for deciding on whether the worker should wear skirt or pants, and sex one being used for playing female or male voices when the worker is hired. Uh, and finally, we, uh, we go to the place that merges everything together, it's village. So it's everything here. Uh, we assemble almost everything in our game in Flash, uh, well, not uh, UI, so <laughs> that's a weird thing. Uh, okay, uh, but how do we approach uh, village creation? Uh, this, uh, it starts with designers deciding on uh, what the next village tem theme should be and what mechanics would be suiting for this theme. Uh, and when they set on a specific one, like the pirate village one from the latest update without the mine minigame or trade port mechanics, they prefer first draft of balance parameters, which are basically what buildings are available, uh, what new puzzles, worker or buildings this village requires, what is the player level progression, etc., etc. Uh, this design, uh, this first dra design draft is passed to the artist which creates new village mock-up. Uh, he also, based on the information about what buildings will be needed, he places some building slots uh, and uh, slices the mock-up, uh, put it together inside village editor. Uh, of course, somewhere in between, we start to implement this new mechanics and uh, prefer, prepared village is exported with the JSFL script uh, and uh, tested and iterated and iterated very many times, many times, and until designer is pleased with the result. Uh, village is created from multiple elements placed uh, by artists in village editor. Uh, these elements are like background, trees, rocks, uh, some other type of decals. Uh, these elements, of course, can be also graphics, animations, particle generators, and uh, of course, building slots. When we want to place a building slot for generic building of uh, similar size, we use a uh, placeholder graphic on the right, you can see there. Uh, but when we want to uh, set up element for specific building, we use the specific building graphic, so it's better visible inside the editor. And also, elements specify uh, something we call remove group ID in their layer names. This ID ties slots and uh, these graphical decals on village, so when the player wants to build building, uh, some, some trees may be removed, so we can initially start with very very a village full of uh, many elements like rocks and trees. But when, build, uh, when it fills up with buildings, uh, it gets a little more, more clear. Uh, also, this is important. When creating level editing tools, uh, remember that everything you place in your editor needs to have some type of unique ID, either force using them on your artist and make some validation code for it, but because you know, artists, uh, and, uh, or generate it somehow if it's possible. 
uh, it's the only way to stay safe because uh, we had this one thing that we didn't use unique ID for slot IDs and when uh, count and order of slots was changed everything started to appear in random places. Uh, you can see here sheep on land and fields on sea. Uh, uh, workers uh, travel uh, through interpolating curve and this curve is placed inside village editor also using a curve tool uh, provided by Flash. And this is another great thing about using uh, uh, production ready advanced graphic editor with scripting support. So check out Flash plus JSFL, seriously. And after weeks of hard work, you can really appreciate, appreciate the beauty. Everything moves, everything overlaps. It's just a pleasure to watch. Okay, so I'll now be giving this to Janek. Hello, I'm Janek. Um, I talk about a config file. Uh, there won't be many visuals here, but I think it's pretty interesting. Um, uh, operating system is uh, one big XLS file. We see it as our own local database. Uh, our de designers in this config file design most of the logical objects in our games. That is puzzles, buildings, village, villages, uh, workers, tools, etc. And each, uh, each uh, definition consists of a uh, unique ID and some parameters. For example, here we have part of a puzzle definition. We can see ID on which board sh should appear, its name, etc. Uh, our dream here was that uh, this tool would allow designers to do their work without our help. They can modify all the parameters, they can even add new objects, new puzzles, new buildings without the need to, 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 to talk to us. Uh, but uh, until, they add some, uh, until they want to add some functionalities, which happens all the time, so it doesn't work in the way we uh, want it. Uh, funny part is that uh, each tab is only part of uh, all the tabs. We have 50 tabs in this uh, config file. Each tab represents different type of objects. And each of those tabs are later exported into comma separated value files, which are very small. And they are easily loaded in the uh, game initialization. Mm, OK, we have uh, our objects. But as I mentioned, designers, designers are forever hundred beasts. And uh, they always want more, so what if we want to define the behaviors of the objects? What if you want to define an object that can alter properties of other objects? Uh, what then? Uh, then we create actions. Uh, I think all already mentioned them. Actions are actually uh, triggered method calls with parameters. Uh, we have a finite, thanks God, finite set of uh, um, actions types. For example, uh, spawn a puzzle, show a dialogue, activate a new achievement uh, set. And uh, uh, designers can uh, attach those uh, actions to, to objects. And depending on the objects, uh, the action will fire in different moments. For example, uh, an action mm, attached to a building will be fired when the building is constructed. The same action attached to a tool will fire when the tool is actually used. Uh, of course, not every action works uh, with uh, every object, uh, yes, but the main feature uh, we are very proud of is that all the actions are restored during game initialization. That is, when the village is uh, loaded, we fire all the actions for all the buildings that were built previously. We simply scan through the history of the buildings and fire each action. Uh, that, uh, that makes it... In this way, the designers can rebalance almost the whole game without the need to change anything in the save file, which, is, uh, which makes it a really great tool for um, updates and patches. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's all for this part, and I, I can see here that next is Olo. Thank you. So, uh, I'd like to talk to you about the third-party software you're using in our game. It's called Fusebox. Uh, Fusebox provides us with many online features we would have to write our own software and have our own server for. And one of the main ones is config file. We use our own offline config file, but we also use an online config with ov which overrides the offline one. And here you can see a sample of it. So on the left side you have keys, and on the right side you have values for those keys. 
Um, it's how we use it, for example. Uh, you can see here on the, le on the left side that we have some server-based values, uh, which, for example, can turn off any server site module from our game. In a few months or years, depending on how good the puzzle craft is, um, we might want to turn off the multiplayer servers because they cost a lot and you know you never have that much money. So we made sure that from the off online config you can turn them off and the modules inside the game will be turned off without the need to patch the game whenever we want to turn them off. So it's very nice. The second thing we are using uh, our online config is for discounts and special one-time offers. Designers can turn on special offers for any given time, then can, they can discount different uh, in-app purchases whenever they want to. So for the user, it will appear as, for example, for, do, for the next two days, they can buy something which is discounted, and we don't have to use any uh, uh, server-side server mechanics on our own. It's all provided by the Fusebox and very creative use of their config. Next on, we have tool which is mostly used by uh, producers and the people who, who like numbers. So there is something called A-B testing, and Fusebox provides us with A-B testing, so whenever a user installs our game or does some action in the game, they can be either uh, they can be categorized into some category based on predefined set of rules. And we can make later different set of config values for those different users and we can test whether we want to go with uh, parameters for some things like puzzles or in-app purchases which were used in A category or B category. And of course, later uh, we can see the different statistics based on those tests. So it's a very nice little tool, and I guess we used it. I can, I can say, actually. Um, next on, also, Fusebox has a very nice feature for advertisement. You know, many games, maybe mobile games, have advertisement in them. We have advertisement on demand in Puzzlecraft 2, so you have to actually click on a building, watch the advertisement, and get some kind of reward for it. And it's all uh, based in the loop of the game, so it's, you're watching actually magical pictures which someone is testing. And what we needed is that Puzzlecraft 2 is a 4 plus game in iTunes, or 3 plus game, so we had to, had to, had to have possibility to disable major content or gambling advertisement inside our game, and Fusebox actually provides us with that. We can create an advertiser blacklist, and those commercials won't be appearing in our game. Ah, I did forget about that. Also, as you know, our game is cross-platform. It runs on three different platforms, iOS, uh, Android, and Windows. And it's all because of Cocos 2 dx It's a cross-platform, lightweight engine written in C++. It's open source and supports so many platforms that I even don't know some of them, actually. No, I no, do. It's nice. It's really nice if you want to make simple games, and uh, it's free. So I do recommend it. What is very good about Cocos 2 dx is that we started our project, Puzzlecraft 2, on iOS only, and at the time, the engine was in version 3.1 but we wanted to release the game on Windows, Universal App, which wasn't supported back then by the engine we had. We didn't want to rewrite iOS version, so we just updated the engine, and we kept two different engine versions which were working together on the same code base. Of course, some, some defines were needed to be done, like here we have different calls, method calls, but in the end, we have same code base for two different versions of the same engine, and it works on all the platforms we are supporting. We approach native functionality and native code in a bit different way than Cocos, actually. Uh, we wrote something called managers, and they're encapsulating native functionality for different platforms inside simple, uh, simple interface. Uh, the manager is creating implementation based on the platform the game was compiled for. So 
if you're compiling for iOS, it creates iOS implementation of the uh, method we want to do. And this hopefully will allow us to not have a platform specific code inside our main code base. But of course, this isn't true all the time because design could not handle that. Uh, the, the biggest part we had which uh, proves that is when we wanted to make a share of picture from our game. And on iOS, they wanted to have this nice pop-up which allows you to choose onto which platform you want to share instead of using the uh, native iOS uh, chooser. And for Android, you can't do it. It just shows you the native chooser. And later on, design didn't, didn't, couldn't remember why they want to have the pop-up inside of the native, uh, native workflow which works the best. Also, as I mentioned, Cocos 2 dx is open source and we are using it in many ways. I think one of the clever ones is to, because game design is a very fluid thing, uh, many things change and a lot of departments are changing what they do at the time. And sometimes we have to create things in our game and make it work without, for example, graphic, graphics which are not yet ready for being exported. So we created some kind of uh, fallback mechanism. If the game wants to access a texture it cannot find, it creates an error texture with the name of the texture that it wants to find. So the game won't crash. It will just show you that, I'm sorry, I couldn't find this texture. You should, you should fix it. You should replace it and make it work. Also, uh, Cocos to DX has very amazing feature of actions. They are a bit different than our config actions. They are Cocos to DX actions. It's a sequencer of given set of different actions, like for example, object translations, delays of time, or method calls. And what is nice is, for example, that when we want to build a building, a lot of logic is happening because that's the way our design wanted it to happen. And because of that, we are calling some logic, then some, again some logic, and then one want to delay because the animation is happening. And during animation, we again want to call some logic, delay the time, and then again call logic. The actions are allowing us to do it. It's very nice, simple, and easy to use. No. Oh. <laughs> Hello again. Uh, now let's talk uh, about text and fonts we use in our, in our game. Uh, we are using system providers provided fonts throughout Puzzlecraft 2, and this provides us with a certain advantages, uh, like the one being that system fonts often provide good multi-language support with uh, abundance of nat national characters, and they also allow us not to include a big TTF file, which is uh, in our case about 10 megabytes with every character we require, we would require, we require, and. Uh, Every megabyte is extra important when you're not doing any post-install resource download and want to make the Apple's 100 limit uh, for over-the-air downloads. But there are some dis big disadvantages like the one that every system provides different set of system fonts and that forces us to use different fonts of every one of them and we have to sometimes check uh, things we do thrice for every system. Uh, there is also one cool thing we do with our fonts. This is because we can't uh, have uh, application package uh, be larger than 100 megabytes, so we don't have the sharpest graphics. We have a little downscale graphics. But to balance it out, uh, we use this simple nifty trick. Uh, every text in PuzzleCraft 2 is rendered with thrice, uh, twice the revolution to make it extra sharp. I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah, you can. Uh, and as, uh, as our research shows, players don't really seem to notice uh, some lower resolution graphics with the, when the text remains crisp, uh, even when playing on the largest of screens. Hello, I'm Jan, and I'll tell you something about uh, how we approach the problem of saving in player's profile. Uh, first, let's some history. In another case, solve in our previous game, we had one big save file, uh, but due to its size and format, uh, I think it was really slow to operate on. So in Puzzlecraft 2, we decided to use multiple small save files, each of them independent from each other. Uh, one save file for a profile, one for each village, one for settings, one for cache. 
uh, they were very small, fast, and treacherous, because at some point we simply uh, didn't care when we were saving the game, because it was so fast. Uh, at some point, uh, we saved the game on every tick when the top bar with the uh, experience bar was uh, updating. It was crazy. Uh, but the main problem that it turned out, uh, I don't want to blame the designers, but they are to blame, uh, that uh, those save files are not 100% independent. And this could happen, and it actually happened in uh, our already launched game, uh, that the safe is broken. Here you can see in fairly advanced uh, profile, a lot of money, you can see plenty of work is running, but there are no buildings whatsoever in this village. Uh, it is caused because the profile file was saved correctly when the village's file was not. And of course, oh, sorry, uh, and of course, um, uh, we are smart enough to mm, override the original file only when the whole uh, write operation is successful. But the problem here is that uh, the profile file saved correctly uh, and it turned out to be in different state than the village. And since they are uh, partially dependent on each other, it makes the uh, progress completely lost and the uh, game state is irreversibly lost. For this to work, uh, you know, uh, we decided to use uh, transactions here. Uh, to transactions, I tell you that uh, uh, when we have multiple of uh, save file calls uh, in a short period of time, we pack them all into one transaction, and the result is that we override the originals only when each of the operations uh, succeeds. I see people nodding. Yes, that is a great solution, but uh, we think that. Uh, Synchronization points are better, as I mentioned already previously when we were talking about uh, royal quests. Mm, okay, that's all for local save. Let's go mm, to the clouds. Uh, cloud save. Uh, it's a funny story because when you started to implement uh, cloud save, it turned out that it's far easier to track, uh, to track uh, progress of one file instead of many. So in the end, all those small save files that are so fast and uh, small are packed uh, together into one single archive. Uh, it works, um, but I think even two lectures won't be enough to explain all the details of the implementation of Cloud Safe. So, but I, still, there are some thoughts I want to share with you. Uh, first, that iCloud implementation is a very long and painful process, but it in the in the end, it works. Uh, Google Cloud Safe is even longer and more, more painful uh, in process, but in the end, it works sometimes. Um, so uh, our pro tip for you is that, uh, for the sake of the future, don't do not implement uh, Cloud uh, Cloud Safe features uh, because it, it is really tr hard to, to track and implement. But if you have to. Uh, make sure to always communicate, uh, communicate to the users what is happening. Trust me, there's nothing worse than dozens of fans uh, that are shouting on your Facebook that they have lost their progress when actually they were logged out from, by the system from the framework and they switched to a local file. It's very hard to uh, explain them what actually happened. Uh, uh, it's far easier to simply show them a message. Hey, you have lost your... Mm, uh, internet connection. Now you're working on the local save. You'll be working on the cloud save when you turn on the internet back. Um, okay, I think this is uh, the last tip I can give you in, in this presentation. Uh, there's no, really nothing more left to say except that, uh, yes, this is how we do our games. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as we still have some time, I, I can see uh, I spent a long promo time. Uh, Puzzlecraft 2, our also game. We have our latest update uh, soon. In May 18th. 18th. Okay, in two days. Uh, go, go for it and check it. But still, uh, I want to show you this. Yes, uh, this is a soundtrack from our uh, latest game. It's uh, not already finished. But you can uh, find our uh, stand in the whole, the main hall, 
uh, we can start. Uh, we can try your chance in our contest, win an Oslo telescope, and also try out the, the game. So, uh, if you have uh, any answers or questions or whatever, please feel free, feel, feel, feel free to ask. No. 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 Oh, there is some. I just wanted to ask you, why aren't you actually synchronizing the online safe with the local, a local safe as it would actually resolve your problem? Because if the player goes offline, well, with any amount of trust you would have for the client, you could actually make sure that his progress is saved in a cloud, but also is saved locally. Uh, yes, this is a great question. Of course, we do synchronize the, those the safe files, but uh, as you know, the say, cloud safe implementation remains uh, works in a way that we have this one file that is synchronized in two ways. We send our local data and the data from server is downloaded there. Still, we, we do this and it, and it works great, but uh, there are some situations when we simply uh, when there appears a conflict, uh, we made some progress locally. Uh, the data was downloaded with uh, a delay from the server during the uh, uh, game. And we do, sometimes we do want to reload the whole game and say, hey, there are some new data. Uh, but uh, um, I think more often we simply uh, let the player play locally and merge the, 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 those files later. Am I right? No, more or less. Uh, does it answer, answer your question? Are there no more questions? Thank you. Um, I'd like to know whether you handle versioning and merge and conflicts with your huge XLS files you mentioned. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to um, rephrase that. Um, uh, Everyone can modify the XLS ah. file, if no, I understood okay. correctly. Uh, uh, okay, and now I get it. Uh, we, we use the Tortoise SVN. It's not the best tool, but, but we use it. And of course, we do not handle merging uh, th those files. When, because, but so every designer has to lock the, the file for the moment they, they uh, uh, operate it on. Uh, and we, so we sometimes use branches, and then the merging is uh, unavailable, unavoidable, but we in, in fact, we want to avoid a, a, this uh, config uh, merging because it can cause uh, a lot of problems which are very hard to track because the game works, but there are some s small details that makes it unbalanced or something. So we don't want to merge the config file at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, there's one. Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have only Fabian. one question. Uh, <laughs> how you handle with uh, updates of balance. Uh, as we mentioned, there are two ways. I have one uh, example. Mm -hmm. uh, in one qu uh, quest, uh, for example, you have 10 coins as a reward, mm -hmm. but you are changing this for 100. Mm -hmm. for new players, it w will not be a problem, mm -hmm. but what with uh, existing players? Uh, th that's a great question. For example, if players play this Royal Quest, uh, on the server side, we store only the identifier piece uh, of the challenges, of the definitions. So if uh, two people have different versions of the game, because one updated and the other did not, because lack of internet or maybe of laziness, we don't care because they, uh, when the player uh, downloads the data all about the quest, each player's progress, and the state of the quest is calculated locally. It's because we have the definition, we have each player's progress, so we, okay, it is completed, give a reward. Uh, the, uh, the, the other player uh, have different conditions for, for, for the win, but we don't care. We want the players uh, as I mentioned, our main reason was, uh, was to allow the players to use this feature without any, any problems. So if there are some uh, uh, there are some differences, we don't care. Everyone is happy. We, we are not punishing anyone. We, at the worst point, we are giving more rewards to the player. That, that was our uh, objective here. Does that answer your question? Partially? Okay. Okay. Fair enough, okay. Oh, there's one. Hello. Hello. I have two questions. Okay. Uh, first is about uh, Windows uh, 
cloud safe? Did you use uh, some solution? Any? No, 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 no. We implemented cloud safe only on uh, Android and iOS. We simply oh. didn't have enough uh, patience to do it on <laughs> Windows. We oh. lost all our nerves on uh, Android implementation. Trust me. Okay, thank you. And the second question is about big CSV file with uh, all the um, designers' uh, data. Uh, did you have tool to deploy changes without rebuild, re rebuild the game uh, uh, on the fly? Uh, well, actually, uh, the designers works on an XLS file uh, in Excel, and uh, they have a tool to export all the CSV files, and they, ha they are loaded only d during the game initialization. So they do, they do not have to recompile the game. They simply they turn restart it. That works. Does answer the question? Yes. Cool. Any more questions? Maybe something about villages or something? Or <laughs> no? Nothing? Really? Oh, there is one. So you showed a um, screen where you had player categorization, mm -hmm. uh, and there was one very interesting category called hackers. So how did you track hackers? I think Ola knows the answer. Uh, we tried to see, for example, we had few different frameworks which were tracking in-app purchases by the player and trying to verify the transaction through Apple servers or Google Play servers. And if we didn't get the uh, transaction verification from Apple or Google, we were marking them with one strike. And with, I think, three strikes, the person was marked as a hacker. And uh, we also were uh, showing them interstitial ads between loading screens because we don't like hackers. And that was the point. So we solely based it on the verifications. At some point, we wanted to implement uh, a feature that if you hacked in some way that, for example, your goal was more than you should have or some kind of, you didn't get achievements for gaining many runes or something, but you had those runes. But in the end, it, there wasn't time, so we just based on, we were just based on the verification from Google and uh, Apple. So just it was that. more of a pirate tracking than hacker tracking, um, right? Yes, yes, I guess our, uh, because uh, our producer was handling the names inside there, I guess, for them, maybe it was just the same thing. Yes, it was more like pirates than, 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 uh, than hackers. Uh, I know that people do, did actually break uh, the encoding and the encoding of our archive and the save file. And in the internet, you could find hacked save files with lots of uh, currencies, and you could just use it. That I know, but actually, we didn't do much about it because. Uh, we would have to create some kind of uh, and better encryption, which would take more of the CPU time. It just we did, just didn't want to. We just didn't care about it actually. Yeah, yeah still a good, good idea, I think. Uh, Thank I, I, you. I wanted uh, something to this topic. Uh, we could find those tr hackers in some way, but still, they are always better. Well, no matter how we set our protections, they're always better. They always find some uh, ways to, to pass them. So f at some point, we simply have to say, OK, that's it. We have uh, our safe file encrypted, and we don't use anything else. If the, the player somehow breaks the encryption, which happened because uh, it is a good lesson, do not store uh, the passwords in a static uh, strings in your code because they are not mangled later, and if you open the save file in any editor, the, the, the only thing that you can see inside all the gibberish is the password. That was very funny. Uh, do not do this. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, as I mentioned, there are simply at some point that we have to say, OK, if they hack, uh, Puzzlecraft 2 is not a competitive game. Uh, there, are no, there are some leaderboards, but they are not, ah, my friend is better, I have to do this. Uh, you know, it's not competitive, it's about, about more like cooperative, so we don't have to care about those uh, hackers. Okay? Thank you. Any more, any more questions? Oh. Uh, yeah, one more question. On the worker screen, you had uh, males and females. What about the LGBT? <laughs> what, about what? what about what? Uh, what about the transgender persons and stuff? You, you don't care about them on your game? We personally do care, but our designers don't.
Okay, well, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, this was Yannick. This was all. I am Michal. Thanks.